If you watched the last part of the series, we went over the prophecies that foretold of the coming Messiah. When we gathered all that information together, it's truly remarkable that one man would fulfill all the things prophesied. Yahshua is the Messiah that was foretold of in every book of the Old Testament, and you must believe in him. So as we get to know him, I want to make sure this series is thorough and provides good foundation. So what I want to do is really set the stage for what Judah and Jerusalem was like during the time Yahshua walked this earth. So we're going to jump right in. Let's begin. Part 11 of this series spoke on when Judah was released from exile by King Cyrus of Persia. They went back to their homeland and rebuilt the temple. This happened during the period of 538 BC to 332 BC. This following information should be used on anyone that disputes the validity of the Bible. Make sure you let them know that their doubts really just show a lack of knowledge of history. Because as we get closer to the Messiah, the world and his records are even more clearer. In the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great steps onto the scene. He was a conqueror. At 334 BC, he started his conquest of the world empire at the time which was Persia. If you remember in part 9, Daniel prophesied about this to Nebuchadnezzar. Alexander the Great, the king of Macedonia, in northern Greece set out on one of the most extensive military expeditions in history. His army swept eastward, conquering the Persian Empire controlled by King Darius III. His conquests included Anatolia, part of Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Phoenicia, which is also part of Turkey, Libya, Lebanon, and other territories. He extended the boundaries of his empire as far as Punjab, India. As part of his military campaign, he captured Jerusalem in 332 BC. This ended the more than two centuries of Persian rule over Judah in which Persia allowed Judah to reign. So now the known world is under Alexander the Great. This is where much of the change of the world really starts. This is the beginning of the Hellenistic period. Alexander was a great conqueror, not just because he took control of vast amounts of land, but it was his method of control of these lands that was special. For instance, Egypt welcomed him as a liberator because they hated Persian rule. They placed him on the throne of pharaohs, giving him the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, and named him the incarnation of Ra and Osiris. This is when he set in motion the plans for the second largest city in Egypt, Alexandria. Alexander's conquests introduced Greek culture into the Eastern Mediterranean world. His rule introduced Hellenism. Hellenism is the study or imitation of ancient Greek culture. And this was why Alexander's rule was so remarkable. Because though he conquered these civilizations, he left the country to the people, but he imported his Greek culture. Cities such as Alexandria and Egypt became influential centers of Greek learning. They also crossed into Judah, also referred to as Judea. The cities of Decapolis, east of Galilee and Samaria, mentioned in the New Testament, were centers of Hellenistic culture. Alexander died 323 BC. His empire was divided among several of his generals. One of these, named Seleucus, governed Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and Syria. Another named Ptolemy governed Egypt. They established the Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties. This was not a peaceful period for them. Now in Judah, life was changing. They were now under Greek captivity, and they were now being forced to adapt to the Greek culture. The Hebrews' life revolved around two centers, the Temple and the Torah. The Temple was of course located in Jerusalem, and it remained the one place where sacrifices could be offered. There were, however, increasing number of local gatherings or synagogues scattered where Jews could read scripture and pray together. These synagogues helped Jews everywhere maintain a sense of community and tradition. As long as they continued with the Torah, they would continue to please Yahweh. But Greek strategy was all about assimilating their culture amongst the world. You did not need to rule a country with power to control them. You just export your traditions and values over to them. This will change them over the generations. Now we must go back to part one of the beginning of this series. I want you to remember that the people of Greece were pagans. This is why we haven't introduced new religions yet because the world was still split up like this. The Hebrews were monotheistic, believing in the one true God, Elohim. And the other empires from Egypt, Babylon, Persia, and now Greece 
believed in the father god, mother god, son of god, pagan structure. Over time, Greece's Hellenistic religious and political culture and their language has significant influence among the aristocratic Jews, basically the uppity high society Jews. The leading priestly families were largely Hellenized, given Greek culture, and they were involved in the heavy financial schemes that fueled rivalries over the priestly offices in Jerusalem. These high society Jews introduced new culture like public nudity and athletic games, attendance at Greek theaters, cultic clubs, being uncircumcised, and a host of other practices that were offensive to the Hebrews. The goal was to remove the foundation of life the Hebrews had. There was a rift between the conservative Jews and the liberal changing Jews. This is where we see Antiochus IV take things to a new level. In 167 BC, he came in and desecrated the temple and established it as a cult of Zeus. The Torah, the laws of the Jews' fathers, were removed and their religious practices, including Sabbath observance, were outlawed. He introduced the idolatrous worship of Zeus into the temple itself and instituted the eating of pork as a test of one's loyalty to him. Antiochus's policies provoked a military response from some Jews. The principal leader of the revolt was a man named Judah, nicknamed Maccabeus, or the Hammer. Accounts of the conflict known as the Maccabean Revolt appeared in the Book of the Maccabees, which are a part of the Apocrypha. The Hellenized Jewish aristocracy, aka the uppity Jews, sided with Antiochus, and that meant that the revolt against Antiochus was also a war of Jews against Jews. The fighting continued until 164 BC. Judah and his troops liberated the Jerusalem temple from the Syrians and began the process of cleansing it from defilement. Judah reached an agreement with the Syrians that officially returned the temple to Jewish control. Antiochus V, having succeeded his father, was apparently willing to reach a compromise and to rescind his father's decrees. This is where the festival of Hanukkah was founded, though it has nothing to do with the command from Yahweh himself. The Maccabees gained complete control of the region and established an independent Jewish kingdom that would continue until 63 BC. During this period, the Jews adopted a number of Hellenistic religious beliefs and practices. I've made a list on my website. The link is in the description box. So while this was all going on, Romans had been conquering lots of land and territories, establishing themselves as a formidable power in the Mediterranean, and they wanted more. So they turned eastward. In 197 BC, Rome conquered Macedonia and Greece was liberated. By 146 BC, Greece was conquered by the Romans. In 63 BC, Rome took control of Judah and Jerusalem, but they left the land in local control. This was during the time of Julius Caesar, so there was a lot of politics going on in Rome. In 38 BC, Herod the Great, the son of Antipater, who was an Edomite, is now on the scene. His ancestors converted to Judaism, and he was raised a Jew, but he was not one by blood. Herod transformed the country. He built the port of Caesarea on the coast and the temple of Augustus in Samaria. He remodeled the Jerusalem temple and next to it built the Antonia Fortress, a Roman military installation. During this time, he was labeled King of the Jews. And this is the beginning of the history that would change the world. Judah was nothing like it was before its exile. Things had changed for them. There were no real leaders and the leaders that were in charge were corrupt and served themselves. There were Hebrews that continued the law and a lot of others that tried to assimilate with the world empires, but many never forgot the covenant and prophecies that Yahweh had said. So in these days of Herod, a priest named Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth from the daughters of Aaron were both righteous before Elohim. They walked in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh blamelessly, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both older. So one day, while Zacharias was serving as priest before Elohim, an angel of Yahweh appeared to him. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of Yahweh, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children to Israel to Yahweh their Elohim. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, 
and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for Yahweh. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of Elohim, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, because he was making gestures to them, but remained speechless. So Elizabeth became pregnant. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by Elohim to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Gabriel came to her and said, Rejoice, highly favored one. Yahweh is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with Elohim. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yahshua. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and Yahweh will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with Elohim nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of Yahweh, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel Gabriel departed from her. Mary went to the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Adonai should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from Yahweh. And Mary said, My soul magnifies Yahweh. And my spirit has rejoiced in Elohim, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he is mighty who has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and returned to her house. Elizabeth had the baby, and it was of course a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard how Yahweh had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And at that time, they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But Elizabeth answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father and asked what he would have called him. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke praising Elohim. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of Yahweh was with him. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit, and prophesied, saying, Blessed is Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, 
and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of Yahweh to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our Elohim, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit, it was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. This was the story of John found in Luke. He was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now Joseph came back to his wife and she was pregnant, but he was a good man and didn't want to make an example of her. So he kept it all secret. But while he was thinking about it, an angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yahshua, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this was done so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Yahweh through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Joseph did as the angel of Yahweh commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Yahshua. Now after Yahshua was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So they said to him, and Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him. And they departed. A star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yahshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem, to present him to Yahweh, as it is written in the law of Yahweh. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to Yahweh, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of Yahweh, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen Yahweh's Messiah. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Yahshua to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed Elohim and said, Yahweh, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelations to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now an angel of Yahweh appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Yahweh through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her child, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. 
Herod died in year four. And at this time, an angel of Yahweh appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And being warned by Elohim in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And this was the story of the birth of the messenger John, and the birth of our Savior, the Messiah, Yahshua, fulfilling all prophecies foretold of his birth. This part of the series was a great deal of history, but it all needed to be understood. The stage needed to be fully set to understand the time when the Messiah appeared in the world. Some major points you should remember are, one, Alexander the Great took control of Judah in the fourth century BC. Two, Greece Hellenized the wealthy in Judah, bringing much Greek culture to the Hebrews. Three, the leaders of Greece dealt harshly with Judah, consecrating their temple. Four, the Maccabees fought back and reclaimed control over Judah and their temple. Five, this rule ended in 63 BC when Rome took control of Judah. Six, this brought the rule of Herod the Great. Seven, Judah and Jerusalem were much different than during the times before their exile. Eight, John the Baptist, a fulfillment of prophecy as the messenger preceding the Messiah, was born. Nine, Mary fulfilled prophecy of the virgin bearing a child. Ten, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, was born who was called Emmanuel, God with us, because he was the Son of God. 11. The Savior was born that will bear the sins of mankind. And this is the beginning of the story of our Messiah, a fulfillment of prophecy from an all-loving, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God. This world seeks to make him insignificant, but you must understand that with all this history going on in the background, if Yahshua was insignificant, we would not have ever heard about him. Greece and Rome were strong world empires. Once again, Judah and Israel could have been forgotten, but that was not what Elohim had planned. He planned that a savior would be born that would bless the world, and this was always his plan from the beginning. He is the seed that would bruise the head of the serpent. And now that you have much detail of the time period that preceded his birth, all the way through the events of his birth, I want you to love the Messiah. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and let it guide you in all things. I want you to spread the gospel. I want you to become a living representation of it. This world is wicked. They aren't teaching you the history of the truth for a good reason. The prophet Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being a priest for me. And this has always been a strategy of the enemy to distract us and keep us blind and dumb so we cannot be priests for Elohim, so that none of us understands the truth and it slowly goes away. We are now reversing that trend. If you follow this series from part one, you have enough understanding that you can combat the lies and the wickedness. Love Yahweh with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and always acknowledge him and he will direct your path. If you continue to acknowledge him, he will guide you. He is awesome. This story is awesome. And now the truth cannot be taken from you. You cannot be destroyed because you're learning knowledge of the most important subject in history. Embrace it and live through it. Nothing else matters, and all I ask is that you live as though that is the truth. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please make sure to give it a like and share it with others. Share it on your Facebook. Show it to your family and friends. Please don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I love hearing from all of you. Please drop a comment and let me know what you think. Thank you for all your support, and thank you especially to those who donate to this ministry. Please know it truly helps and blesses me. Thank you again. I love you all.